Okay, I'm going to be talking today about security of online storage, or maybe more accurately, or given the talks that preceded me in the previous session, I could be talking about security of uh, uh, storage in the cloud. So here's the vision, and you can see that this is coming. Pretty soon, all information of interest is going to be stored online and accessible from everywhere. And we want this information to be stored persistently so we don't have to worry that it will be lost in the case of failures. Uh, we'd like it to be shareable and also easy to locate, query, and find. Uh, already in the previous talks, people have been talking about this vision. Um, and here are some examples of the kinds of information that will be stored online. Uh, all of the files that you currently keep on your PC, uh, medical records, that was alluded to in the previous session. Also, many corporations, instead of trying to maintain their data independently, will move their information onto the cloud. And also, of course, all that huge quantity of scientific information that's being collected. Um, and I'm just going to talk first about a couple of scenarios about what we can see happening. This is the one people haven't been talking about, but it's the one that I find the most appealing personally. I'd like to get the data off my laptop. Um, I'd like to be able to access it from anywhere. One advantage of getting it off my laptop is that then if I want to use it from my cell phone or from another computer, I can have access to it without having to do anything special to make it available. Uh, I'd also like to get rid of the problems of having to keep backups for my information. I don't want to have to worry any longer about what happens if my computer fails and important information that I had stored on there uh, is no longer accessible to me. Uh, and then, of course, there's an advantage to putting my information online because now I can make my private information accessible to others, like my family or my students. But, of course, I want to be able to do that in a very controlled way so that I don't have to worry that, in fact, it shows up on Facebook and all of a sudden my tax information is accessible to everyone. Okay, here's a second scenario. This one I think we've already touched on. I'd like my medical records to be available everywhere. I don't want to have them tied up in my doctor's office. In fact, I happen to belong to the MIT Health Plan where records are already online, but they're only available inside the MIT Health Plan. And for example, when I went over to Mass General to have something checked out, I had to make sure that the pieces of information they needed got from the MIT Health Plan to Mass General. That just seems kind of silly. So I'd like my information to be available everywhere. You can see this coming with Google Health, but there are immense uh, privacy and confidentiality problems associated with this. What I'm going to do in my talk today is I'm going to drill down a bit and talk about what is required of the storage system that would underlie moving all of your information online. And uh, there are a whole host of problems, huge numbers of problems uh, involved in making this dream a reality in a way that we would be happy with. First of all, whatever that storage is, it has to be highly scalable. We're talking, as people have told you, about billions of users. This is going to require millions, of, eventually, of computers uh, storing that information in a way that makes it uh, easy, you know, that allows it to continuously scale as the number of users uh, gets bigger and bigger. We also have to be able to provide access to this information in a way that provides good performance. People will not be happy if it turns out that they have to wait as long as even 10 seconds in order to get access to their information. Uh, those are very important problems, but I'm going to focus on a different problem, security, security, security. Security is going to cover a wide range of things, it really does. Uh, here are two hugely important ones. Confidentiality, we've already been talking about. People have referred to it as privacy. Um, another problem that we're going to be concerned with is integrity. When you get your information, you want to be sure that it really is the information you stored, exactly in the form that you stored at the last time that you modified it. Or you might be getting information from somebody else, and you'd like to know for sure that the information you're getting is the information they put there. And not only that, but it was the last information they put there. However, I'm not actually going to talk about these either. I'm going to talk about two other aspects of security, uh, namely what I call reliability and availability. These have also been referred to in the last uh, session. Reliability means that whatever information I put online will not be lost uh, in spite of various kinds of failures that can happen. And availability means that not only will it not be lost, but it'll be there when I need it. It'll be accessible 24-7. 
Now, in order to achieve reliability and availability, it's going to require replication because, and I'm going to give you a little example of that, but it's pretty obvious. Uh, if I stored my information on just one server in the internet. So what I have here on this slide is a little picture that represents, in a very stylized way, the internet, where there's a server providing, in this particular uh, talk, a, the storage service, and then there are many users that are accessing that server to get access to their data. If you had your data at just one server, things are really not good, because a failure of that server means that, at the least, your data is inaccessible until that server comes back up again. At the worst, your data might be lost forever, depending upon how bad a failure it was and what the state of the server was at the moment of the failure. For example, if it hadn't managed to write your information to a media device that survives a failure, then your information, at least the most recent version of it, is lost. So you can solve this problem by having replication. And here I show you a little setup that has three computers replicating your data. This is known to be the minimal number that you need um, to survive a failure of one computer and provide reliability and availability. In this case, if one of those computers fails, well, no problem, as long as your data was stored at a subset whoops, um, elsewhere on those computers, then it'll be accessible when you need it. And actually, if you think back to Alfred Spector's talk, he showed you, or maybe it was, <laughs> I'm getting a little confused about whose talk was Hughes, whose, but uh, both, I think, Alex and, and Eric Brewer's talk showed you examples where they just sort of showed a, through a few replicas and argued that, you know, that was what you needed to solve the problem. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. And so what I'm going to do in the talk today is just show you a little bit of why it's, in fact, hard just putting stuff on multiple replicas isn't a solution to the problem. You have to have some technology at work in order to make sense out of those multiple copies. So I'm going to be talking today a little bit about what's behind replication protocols. These are the programs together with the network communication that ensure that your replicated data is what you want it to be. You want it to be the most recent copy. You want it to reflect everything that's happened to that data since you started to use it online. And you want to make sure that that information isn't lost and is accessible in spite of both network failures and machine failures. The internet can fail. It can lose your messages. It can replay them later. Um, and also, of course, the machines themselves can failure, fail. And it turns out that there are two kinds of failures we worry about, what are called benign failures, where, for example, all your machine does is either running or it's not running, um, and Byzantine failures where things are much worse. I'm going to focus on benign failures, and I'll come back to Byzantine failures at the end. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of what the issue is when you're trying to cope with Byzantine failure. So here I have the same three replicas. Think about those clients at the bottom of representing millions of clients, but all I need is three replicas in order to survive one failure. And imagine that my first client, uh, client A, sends a request to the replicas to write some information. Now, this operation needs to complete at that client when he gets two responses. You can't wait for three responses because the third replica might be down. That's the whole point, is that you want to be able to survive one failure. So imagine that this operation completes when data is at the first and the third replica, but the second replica never even got the request. Somehow the network lost it. Okay, now what might happen is before there wasn't a failure of a node, now the node fails. Replica 3 fails. Okay, still, you know, we have some hope here because replica 1 still has the information. And now a second a request comes along from client B asking to do another kind of write. Okay, well, if we do things in a naive way, you can see that we're going to end up in an inconsistent state because replica 1 knows about A and B and replica 2 only knows about B. Now, this is not always a problem, but supposing that what you're doing is you're using an eBay-like system, and what your request was was to bid $10 more than the previous bid. Okay, well, you can see that at replica A, you'll get a different answer than you'll get at replica B, or rather, at the first replica and the second replica, and that will lead to an inconsistency in the state of the system. So you need to actually have a sophisticated protocol that sorts all of this out. 
And the ordering system, the, the, the basic problem is actually ordering. So what you need to do is you need to order those requests the same way at every replica. Then you can be sure that they'll all be in the same state and they'll all reflect all the things that have happened in the past. And the ordering solution that has been worked out by researchers over the last 20 years, this is actually research that primarily happened in the late 80s and early 90s, is to use a, what's called a primary. Basically what you do is you say, well, one of those replicas is gonna be the boss. And it's going to decide on the order of the requests, and it's gonna tell all the other replicas, which act sort of as slaves, exactly what to do. And the other replicas will obey this, and that way we can be sure that everything is happening in the right order. However, there's a little fly in the ointment here. The problem is that the primary might fail. And so you need an answer for this also. Um, you need the other replicas to watch the primary. And when they suspect that it fails, notice that they can't be sure that it failed because one of the problems in the network is uh, the absence of a message will never tell you for sure what's going on at the other end. But if they suspect that it's failed, they simply run a protocol to elect a new primary. And that primary will then pick up from the old one and continue. And you can see that there's going to be some issues here. Um, so we're going to have to, for example, make sure that when the new primary picks up, it actually knows all the operations that the old primary had ordered. Um, we need to be able to deal with all possibilities, you know, all failures of nodes, all problems that might happen on the network. We need to handle node recovery. For example, uh, I showed you one of the earlier slides that one of the nodes had failed after knowing about A, but not B. We need to make sure when that replica comes back, back up again that it gets up to date. And not only that, but we have to do this all in a way that provides competitive performance. Ideally, we'd like performance that approximates uh, that of a single machine. So we'd like to, in some sense, provide the same behavior you'd get out of a super reliable single machine while using a bunch of replicas. That's the goal of these protocols. Now, I'm not going to try to talk to you about the details of this protocol. It gets highly technical. But my point is, there are a lot of tricky issues that you have to get right in order to make this kind of protocol work correctly. Now, as I said earlier, this is work that was done primarily in the 19, in, from 1987 to 2002. Uh, that's when the protocols that are in use today were developed. And this work was going on simultaneously, both in industry and in academia, as so often happens when people are working on uh, new techniques. Uh, it took more than 10 years before any of this showed up in industry. Uh, but by uh, the late, uh, maybe around 2002, uh, some of the kinds of computations that were going on, for example, at Google, people there discovered they really needed to do this kind of replication, and so these kinds of uh, protocols are now being used in practice. And this sort of lag from research to uh, adoption is very commonplace in our industry. Uh, people in research are looking for what would be the right solution for problems that they see coming up. Industry won't bother to adopt those solutions until they see the problems in everyday life. And so we, uh, you know, this is not a surprising fact. Meanwhile, of course, the research community moved on and starting in about 1996, started to work on the more challenging uh, Byzantine failures. So Byzantine failures um, are failures, so there's, now there's a third possibility. Before that, we had computers that ran or computers that weren't running at all. With Byzantine failures, there's a third possibility. The computer just gets damaged and starts to run uh, in a bizarre way that we refer to as Byzantine behavior. Now, generally speaking, when a machine gets damaged, you can't, it's not making much sense, and therefore it's not really causing you any problems. But in fact, with the kinds of attacks that are going on today, it might actually start to appear to be acting correctly, even though in fact it's not doing the right thing. So for example, it might uh, say, yes, I'll do your right, but then throw away the request. Or it might say, here's the answer to your read, but it doesn't, in fact, give you the right answer. And these are examples of things that they can do. In other words, machines will lie. They'll also collude with one another, which is another thing you have to worry about. And the causes, uh, the real cause of this is malicious attacks, uh, not just simple spamming, but viruses and worms where uh, you know, bad software malware is, is put onto your computer and causes the machine to misbehave in a way uh, that's very damaging to the system. 
So I'm just going to show you a little example of Byzantine behavior to show you that it's going to affect these protocols. Uh, the first point to notice here is that whereas before I had three replicas, now I have four. Okay, and that's because of the fact that there can be lies. And again, uh, we're going to want to be able to, since we're surviving one failure, any client request uh, has to be able to complete when hearing only from three of the four replicas, because of course the fourth one that you didn't hear from might actually be failed. So what I'm showing you here is that the first client A does its right request and gets back three responses. Two of them come from honest nodes, but one of them comes from this malicious node, the one that's uh, the little devil. And the fourth message doesn't actually make it to the honest node, so it doesn't know anything about it. Okay, now B comes along and wants to do its operation. And what happens this time is that its message doesn't make it to honest node one, but makes it to the other three replicas. The problem is that one of these is this liar, and the liar uh, pretends that A never happened. So one of the things you can see here is that if I use a simple sort of majority rule solution here, it's not going to work because what I have is a bad node that's lying and I have an honest node that doesn't know anything about A. Okay, I have one honest node that knows about both. So what I need is a protocol that makes sure that the honest behavior survives and we make sure that the bad node doesn't um, get in the way. So the solution's going to be the same. We're going to use the same idea of a primary that everybody watches but the protocols are considerably more complicated because of the fact that we have to deal with these lies and with collusion. There's more messages, more replicas, as I showed you, and altogether a much more difficult protocol to reason about. Uh, but in the end, this work did get done. Uh, the, the protocol, which I refer to as BFT here, a protocol primary uh, backup protocol that uh, is able to handle Byzantine failures, was developed in the period 1996 to 2002. To my knowledge, it has not been adopted in industry yet, but I expect this is coming. I don't think it's necessarily going to be used everywhere, but it's going to be used where there's particularly critical data. Like, for example, the whole internet works on key distribution centers that hand out new public-private key pairs to people. These are particularly uh, important. If you get that wrong, then the whole fabric of the internet is going to collapse. And so that's a place where you could imagine that we would use these protocols. Okay, so that's where we are as of around 2002-2003. Uh, what's happening in the research community is there's still quite a bit of work going on in replication, trying to improve on these protocols, although actually BFT is pretty good as it stands. Uh, also, there's immense problems in scaling up. Uh, you can't have one replica group uh, taking care of millions of users. You have to have many, many groups of replicas, and you have to have a way, nevertheless, that everybody can find their data and that the right kinds of security properties are being preserved. Uh, but now, you know, what I think is particularly interesting are these other security issues that I showed on my first slide and then didn't bother to talk about. One point I want to make is that we sort of get integrity out of the system already because all the responses come from the right number of answers and there's a sufficient number of honest answers there that you can trust the result. So integrity is not the big deal, but confidentiality, privacy is an immense problem as was emphasized in the previous uh, uh, session, and that's one place where the research community is really busy working at this point. Of course, as was mentioned previously, it's a combination of technical solutions as well as legal solutions, but the security and confidentiality problems are immense, and that's where I think I see the big uh, research push going on at this point. Thank you. <laughs>